On the morning of August 14th, 2005, the skies above Athens had a ghostly visitor. 10 kilometers above the city, a passenger plane was circling in complete radio silence. Nobody had spoken to the aircraft for over two hours. Fearing a terrorist attack on the city, the Greek military scrambled fighter jets to intercept the aircraft. The pilots of these jets reported seeing nothing but stillness inside the plane, apart from one person, who was not a pilot, moving inside the cockpit. Then, the plane banked to one side and started descending towards the ground. Minutes later, it crashed into the hills just north of Athens, killing all 121 passengers and crew. What could have caused such an unusual series of events, and were similar accidents likely to happen in the future? In the early morning of August 14th, 2005, 115 passengers and six crew boarded Helios Flight 522 in Larnaca Airport, Cyprus. Their destination was Prague in the Czech Republic, with a stopover in Athens, Greece. It was the summer travel season in Europe, and most of the passengers were holidaymakers from Cyprus, who would be getting off the plane in Athens. The captain of the flight was highly experienced. At 59 years of age, he had nearly 17,000 flying hours on his record. The first officer of the flight was 51 years old, with over 7,500 hours of flying experience. Many air crash shows like to stress the experience and professionalism of the crews involved in these accidents, but things are different for this flight. These two pilots had flown together on numerous occasions, and the first officer had often complained to family and friends about the overbearing and authoritarian attitude of the captain. This was an issue that the airline too had been made aware of. The first officer, for his part, had a checker training record, with numerous training and check pilots noting that he had difficulties with checklists and procedures. This would later become crucial. The aircraft being used for this flight was a 7-year-old Boeing 737-300. The 737 is the best-selling passenger jet in the sky, and is a favourite among airlines for its reliability and cost efficiency. The aircraft took off into the early morning sky above the Mediterranean Sea, with all indications normal. As they passed through 10,000 feet, the crew contacted air traffic control in Nicosia, and the captain requested a cruising altitude of 34,000 feet. This was approved by air traffic control, and the aircraft continued its climb. As the plane passed through 12,000 feet, however, an alarm sounded. This alarm confused the crew, as it normally sounded on the ground when the aircraft was not correctly configured for takeoff. The crew could not understand why they were hearing it in the air. 90 seconds after it started, the captain contacted Helios Operations Centre and reported that he had the takeoff configuration warning alarm. The captain also mentioned that the ventilation cooling fan lights were off, and he asked where the circuit breakers for this were. The ground engineer on the other end of the line told the captain that they were behind the captain's seat, and that these lights were supposed to be off anyway. Confused, the engineer asked the captain to confirm the problem, and the captain said, they are not switched off. This message made no sense to the engineer. Immediately, something came to mind. That very engineer had been working on the aircraft before the flight, and had tested the pressurization system. The instruments for this system are located very close to those which the captain was referencing in his confusing reports. The engineer asked the captain to confirm that the pressurization mode selector was in the auto position. Rather than answering this, the captain simply asked again where the equipment cooling circuit breakers were. Again, the engineer replied that they were behind the captain's seat. As this conversation took place, the passenger's oxygen mass had dropped. Shortly afterwards, Helios Ground Operations Dispatch called the flight crew, but there was no response. The aircraft levelled off at 34,000 feet, and no further attempts to contact the aircraft were successful. Helios Operations called Nicosia Air Traffic Control and asked the controller to contact the flight. For four minutes, the controller tried to contact the flight, but no response was received. The controller then asked another aircraft if they were able to get through to the plane, but they too were unable. The aircraft entered Greek airspace without contacting Athens Air Traffic Control and continued on its flight plan route. Just in case, Nicosia Air Traffic Control contacted the plane on an emergency frequency, but still received no reply. The controller contacted Athens Control and asked, Did Helios call you? The Athens Controller answered, Not yet. Aware of the possibility that the aircraft may simply be experiencing issues transmitting on the radio, the Athens Controller issued the aircraft a descent clearance. There was no response from the aircraft, and it made no attempt to descend. More than 20 further attempts to contact the aircraft were made, both on emergency frequency and through other nearby aircraft, but all were unsuccessful. Athens Air Traffic Control contacted the Greek Air Force at a quarter past seven, and they scrambled two F-16 fighter jets to intercept the aircraft. By this time, the plane, flying on autopilot, had followed its flight path all the way to Athens Airport and along the missed approach route while flying at 34,000 feet. At 7.37 a.m., the plane entered the holding pattern at the KEA VOR. During its sixth holding pattern, the plane was intercepted by the fighter jets. At half eight in the morning, 
The pilot of one of the F-16s reported that the captain's seat was vacant and that the first officer's seat was occupied by somebody who was slumped over the controls. They also reported seeing passengers sitting motionless inside the passenger cabin, with oxygen masks against their faces. Inside the cabin was dark, but they could make out the silhouettes of the oxygen hoses and masks against the daylight shining in through the windows on the other side of the cabin. While the plane was in its tenth round of the holding pattern, one of the F-16 pilots observed a person wearing a light blue shirt and a dark vest enter the cockpit and sit down in the captain's seat. This person put on a set of headphones and appeared to place his hands on the panel directly in front of him. Seconds later, the left engine flamed out. The aircraft turned steeply to the left and began descending. The F-16 pilot tried to attract the attention of the person in the captain's seat, but was unsuccessful. The F-16s followed at a distance as the plane continued its descending left-hand turn. When the 737 was at about 7,000 feet, the person in the captain's seat finally acknowledged the presence of the F-16s and made a hand motion. The F-16 pilot responded with a hand signal for the person to follow him on down towards the airport. The person in the captain's seat pointed downwards, but did not follow the F-16. Just before 9am, the aircraft turned further left to head southwest, and its right-hand engine flamed out. The aircraft continued to descend rapidly, and roughly four minutes later, it collided with the hills just northwest of Athens. The aircraft was destroyed by the impact, and all 115 passengers and six crew were killed. Investigators got to work immediately after the accident. As well as examining the wreckage, they interviewed the engineers who had worked on the aircraft in the preceding days and weeks. Near the start of this episode, I mentioned that the pilots on this flight had a checkered record. What I didn't mention was that the aircraft's record was not exactly spotless either. A few days before Christmas, the year before the accident, the plane had experienced a rapid decompression at 35,000 feet on its way from Warsaw in Poland to Larnaca. The crew made an emergency descent to 10,000 feet where the air was breathable and landed at Larnaca. This led to a full inspection of the aircraft, after which a ground engineer adjusted the aft right hand service door. He pressure tested the aircraft and found that it was safe to fly. Then, months later, the very day before it crashed, the aircraft had another pressurization issue, also involving the aft service door. Here's an excerpt from the accident report. On the 13th of August 2005, on the flight prior to the accident, the Helios Airways Boeing 737-300 aircraft, Cyprus registration 5BDBY, departed London Heathrow, United Kingdom for Larnaca, Cyprus, at 9 o'clock in the evening. The aircraft landed at Larnaca at 1.25am on the 14th of August 2005. During the flight, the cabin crew noted a problem with the right aft service door. The cabin crew made an entry in the aircraft cabin defect log that aft service door seal around the door freezes and hard bangs are heard during flight. The write-up by the cabin crew was transferred to the aircraft technical log by the flight crew as aft service door requires full inspection. If you think back to the conversation the ground engineer had with the captain as the plane climbed out over the Mediterranean, you might see where this is going. The night before the accident flight, the ground engineer performed a pressurization leak test on the aircraft. As part of this test, the pressurization mode selector on the overhead panel was switched to the manual position. Investigators determined that when the engineer was finished performing this test, he forgot to put the switch back in the auto position. Passenger aircraft fly at altitudes where the air is too thin to sustain life. Their way of getting around this is by keeping the air inside the plane at a higher pressure than the air outside. While a plane may be flying at 34,000 feet, the pressure of the air inside the plane would be closer to that found at 8,000 feet. When the pressurization mode selector is put in the manual position, however, this pressurization does not take place, and the air inside the cabin is almost equal in pressure to the air outside. For humans, the result of exposure to this thin air is a condition known as hypoxia, or hypooxia, low oxygen in the bodily tissues. The brain is the first organ to be affected, with initial symptoms including confusion, problems concentrating or performing well at novel tasks, and eventually, unconsciousness and death. While forgetting to put this switch back to automatic was an oversight on the part of the engineer, it should not have been a fatal one. The pilots, as part of their pre-flight duties on the morning of the flight, were expected to check, among other things, the equipment cooling switches, the cabin pressurization panel, and the flight crew oxygen masks. On top of this, this was the aircraft's first flight of the day, and as such, the pilots would have been expected to be especially vigilant in these pre-flight duties, in case switches or dials had been changed from their normal positions overnight. As it turned out, the pilots missed the position of the switch during their pre-flight procedure. Aviation safety is achieved through redundancy, however, so these failures of vigilance, one on the part of the engineer and one on the part of the first officer, should not have been enough to doom the plane. The pressurization mode selector was to be checked on two more occasions. Once, during the before taxi checklist, which is an oral checklist carried out before the plane pushes back from the gate, and again as part of the after takeoff checklist, 
Thus, the pilots had three opportunities to notice that the pressurization mode selector had been set to manual. They missed each of these opportunities. The pilots had another opportunity to notice the problem as they passed through 12,000 feet when the cabin altitude warning sounded. The flight data recorders showed that when this happened, the pilots disengaged the autopilot and autothrottles and then reduced the engine throttle. This is entirely consistent with them thinking that the warning was the takeoff configuration warning, as this is what a pilot would do if that warning had occurred on the runway. Indeed, this was verified by the Helios dispatcher, who noted that when the captain had contacted him, he had said that the takeoff configuration alarm had sounded. The Accident Investigation Board concluded that this confusion likely occurred because in the course of his or her career, a pilot was generally only likely to hear this alarm when it referred to a takeoff configuration error, and never when it had to do with cabin altitude. In fact, pilots would typically hear this warning multiple times every day, while testing that it was working to detect incorrect takeoff configuration. Dozens of similar incidents had occurred in the previous decades, where pilots had heard this alarm during climb out and mistaken it for the takeoff configuration warning. In those cases, other factors, such as the flight attendants notifying the pilots of the situation in the cabin, generally meant that they ended more positively than was the case in this event. The Air Accident Investigation Board also considered that the stress caused by the sounding of a serious alarm at an unexpected stage of the flight may have caused the pilots to fall back on an automatic reaction, namely reducing engine thrust rather than trying to troubleshoot the problem first. Yet another chance to identify the problem happened when the passenger oxygen mass automatically dropped. When this happened, another light on the overhead panel illuminated, which read Pass Oxy On, or Passenger Oxygen On. This additional warning light went unnoticed, and investigators were unable to determine whether this is because the flight crew were already beginning to experience the initial symptoms of hypoxia. It is one of the ironies of hypoxia that its presence is the very thing that makes it hard to detect. Investigators determined that ultimately, a mixture of stress due to the warning alarms, poor crew resource management, degraded thinking due to hypoxia, and a fixation on the initial suspected source of the warnings, the equipment cooling system, led the pilots down a path where it never occurred to them that they may be experiencing a pressurization problem. Six minutes after the captain first contacted the Helios Operations Center, and as the aircraft passed through 28,900 feet, communications from the aircraft ceased. The air pressure inside the plane continued to drop, and shortly afterwards, both pilots fell unconscious. The passengers would have been fully conscious for a number of minutes after this, as their masks provide about 15 minutes of oxygen. The question then remains, who was this mystery person seen in the cockpit when the plane was over Athens? Data from the cockpit voice recorder only showed the last 30 minutes of the flight, and showed that at least one cabin crew member retained consciousness for the duration of the flight and entered the flight deck more than two hours after takeoff. Investigators determined that in order for the flight attendant to have moved forward in the aircraft to reach the flight deck, he must have used a portable oxygen bottle. In fact, three of the four portable oxygen cylinders were found in the wreckage to have been used. The investigation board were puzzled by the fact that the cabin attendant might not have attempted to enter the flight deck until hours after the first indication that the aircraft was experiencing a non-normal situation. Of course, in the absence of a longer duration cockpit voice recorder, it is not possible to know whether this or any other cabin crew member had attempted to or succeeded in entering the flight deck. By listening to the cockpit voice recording, colleagues were able to identify this man as Andreas Prodromu, a 25-year-old Helios flight attendant. As well as being a flight attendant, Prodromu held a commercial pilot's license, However, he was not qualified to fly the 737 or anything larger than a small propeller aircraft. Horrifyingly, the cockpit voice recorder revealed that Prodromu had made several mayday calls after the first engine failed, but perhaps because of stress or hypoxia, he had not pressed the transmit button as he made these calls. Regardless, the chances of survival were slim. While the aircraft was still well within flying distance of Athens Airport when Prodromu entered the cockpit, the investigation board determined that his flying experience was insufficient for him to gain control of the aircraft and make a landing, especially considering the extreme stress he would have been under and also potential hypoxia. Even if he had managed to land the plane in Athens, none of the other passengers or crew members would have survived. Their brains had been exposed to an hypoxic environment for two and a half hours, long enough to cause irreversible brain damage. Everybody on board was doomed from the moment the pilots fell unconscious. In response to this accident, and to dozens of similar close calls in the years leading up to it, the final report made a number of safety recommendations so that this crash was the last of its kind. The safety board recommended that Boeing emphasize flight crew training and awareness in relation to A, the importance of verifying the bleed and pack system configuration after takeoff, and B, the understanding and recognition of the differences between cabin altitude and takeoff configuration warnings. They also recommended that Boeing clarify the maintenance procedure for the cabin pressure leakage test and include an explicit instruction for the pressure mode selector to be placed in the auto position when the test is finished. 
Another recommendation was made to Boeing to reconsider the design of the cabin pressure control system controls and indicators so it was better to attract and retain the flight crew's attention when the pressurization mode selector position is in the manual position. At the time of the crash, only a green light indicating manual was illuminated. They made a further recommendation that all airlines are required to amend cabin crew procedures so that when the oxygen masks deploy in the cabin due to insufficient cabin pressure and the aircraft does not level off or start a descent, the cabin crew members situated closest to the flight deck must be required to immediately notify the flight crew of the oxygen mask deployment and to confirm that the flight crew have donned their oxygen masks. They also recommended that aircraft manufacturers are required to install in newly manufactured aircraft and on a retrofit basis in older aircraft, a visual and or oral warning alert when the cabin altitude exceeds 10,000 feet. Finally, the board recommended that practical hypoxia training become a mandatory part of flight crew and cabin crew training. These recommendations were gradually implemented by the airline industry, and since the crash of Helios 522, there has been a significant reduction in pressurization-related problems on passenger aircraft. Since this accident, not a single passenger jet has crashed for similar reasons.